Hey guys, what's up? It's CS back here with another installment, and here's my review for UFC 167, St. Pierre versus Hendricks. Alright guys, now that was a very eventful card. There's lots to talk about, which I'll get to all in a sec, but we might as well start off with the main event between George St. Pierre and Johnny Hendricks. Wow, what a fight. Awesome all around. I wasn't exactly bored throughout the 25 minutes like I thought I would be with George St. Pierre just jabbing away and collecting a decision like that because that's what I thought we would see. But Johnny Hendricks, in my opinion, actually went out there, fought George St. Pierre hard for five rounds and actually got one, two, and four in my scorecards in an exciting fashion as well. He forced George St. Pierre to do a lot of things that George St. Pierre is not accustomed to. Uh, George St. Pierre was looking to just move away from Johnny's power hand and just jab in Johnny's face, uh, land low kicks when he could, or Superman punches George St. Pierre clearly thought he was going to do that, and when he wasn't able to, you know, he had to fight in survival mode, kind of. And I thought Johnny Hendricks was able to get the better of the exchanges in rounds 1, 2, and 4. Now, I'll explain why I thought he got the controversial round 1. And that's because George St. Pierre really didn't have any significant offense besides that takedown, if you want to call that significant offense. George St. Pierre also got taken down himself, but it's not like Johnny could do a heck of a whole lot with that. But this is why I gave to Johnny Hendricks. When George St. Pierre was going for that other takedown, Johnny was stuffing that, elbowing George St. Pierre at the same time, hurting George St. Pierre, and that's why George had to let go of it. You know what I'm saying? So in my opinion, that's effective striking and effective grappling at the same time, which I thought were part of the judging criteria. So I'm trying to think of how George St. Pierre gets that round. Was it because of aggression? Because I don't think his... Aggression was thoroughly that more aggressive than what Johnny Hendricks was able to do that in that little exchange. Was it due to octagon control? I really didn't think he was controlling anything in that round. Was it because of effective striking? Well, Johnny Hendricks at that point had more effective strikes and more strikes in general. So I'm not seeing what the judges were seeing in round one. Now, it was Sal Diamato and Tony Weeks who gave the fight, or should I say that round, to George St. Pierre at that point. Of course, they're the ones who ended up giving it to George St. Pierre after because they, like Glenn Trowbridge, scored the rest of the fight, round two for Hendricks, round four for Hendricks, and round three and five for St. Pierre. So for Sal Diamato and Tony Weeks, that equates to 48-47 for St. Pierre on their cards. And for Glenn Trowbridge, because he gave round one to Johnny Hendricks, 48-47, and I thought he got it right. So it's unfortunate that only one of them got it right in my eyes. But if you guys can come up with an explanation to how George St. Pierre definitely won round one, then tell me in the comment section below because I don't because I want to know because really I just can't think of a legit explanation. I just think it's Tony Weeks and Sal Diamato were just sleeping on that round. Glad they got the rest of it right, but still in the end the wrong guy won in my eyes because I thought those guys got it wrong. So. I was also looking at Sherdog, MMA Junkie, whoever else was doing play-by-play, -play, even on Twitter, and everyone had it for Johnny Hendricks. I don't know anyone who had it for George St. Pierre in the end. You know what? It is what it is. Uh, I think that we do a better job of applying the scorecards than these judges. Maybe these judges need to see what we're seeing as far as monitors uh, because they don't get to see that. They just get to see through the cage and whatever they see is what they see. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say what they should do as far as the judging system. If you guys think anything needs to be changed, let me know in the comment section below. Again, controversial fight, but I thought round one was ultra obvious when you break down the scoring criteria. I don't think neither guy had aggression points over the other or octagon control, but I thought that St. Pierre wasn't as effective striking-wise or grappling-wise because of that stuff takedown and getting the elbows thrown at him. So, my opinion, the true champion should be Johnny Hendricks. He'll get that title eventually because it looks like St. Pierre doesn't want to have any more of this and I can't blame him. He has a lot of fight years on him. Who knows if he's going to retire eventually after that weird ass speech. So, who knows what's running through George St. Pierre's mind. Hopefully, we find out soon enough. It's been an honor to watch George St. Pierre fight. The guy is ultra class and he's very good at what he does. Still hasn't dropped a decision in his career, so I've got to tip my hat off to him for that. Although I thought he should have dropped this one. So, shout out to Johnny Hendricks. Alright, now it's time to move on to the rest of the card. So, starting off with the co-main event in light heavyweight between Chael Sonnen and Rashad Evans. This is what happens when Rashad Evans feels like beasting. He put Chael Sonnen in a box. 
He's pretty much the best athlete in the light heavyweight division besides John Jones, I would say. I'm trying to think of other guys, and I can't. Like, Rashad, look, ultra fit for this one. He had a game plan. He looked strong. And he out-athleted Chael Sonnen in pretty much every predicament in that four-minute fight, especially in the clinch. Uh, Chael Sonnen really had nothing for him when Rashad was able to get his position. Of course, wound up getting TKO'd in the end. Did Chael Sonnen. Rashad's a beast. Like, that mount looked nasty, and... Yeah, he went Donkey Kong on him. So, nice win for Rashad. What's next for him? I'd like to see him face Glover Teixeira, to be honest. Now, I know Teixeira is lined up for John Jones, but I'd like to see John Jones take on Alexander Gustafson for the rematch and then have a contender out of Rashad Evans versus Glover Teixeira. I think that would make the most sense for the light heavyweight division. If not, maybe Rashad Evans versus Vitor, because that would be fun as hell. So, I don't know what they want to do in the light heavyweight division. Of course, Vitor, he's not sure if he wants to be in 185 or 205. Probably 185. Yeah, who knows? We'll see. It's uh, turbulent times for either division. It's pretty fun. Uh, maybe Rashad moves down himself. Who knows? But he looked pretty darn strong at 205 versus Chael Sonnen, who, in my opinion, is still a very solid light heavyweight himself. Now, I don't know if he's been bouncing back between weight classes and all, but... He's still a legitimate 205er, if you ask me, with his track record. Of course, he beats most 205ers, if you ask me. And he did beat Shogun Hua, so he's still a very legitimate win at this weight class. And I thought Rashad Evans proved that he was even more legitimate with that TKO victory. Very nicely done for Mr. Evans. Anyway, moving on to that welterweight matchup between Robbie Lawler and Roy McDonald, which I definitely gave to Robbie Lawler, 29-28. Most people did, but the one judge gave it to... 29-28 to Rory McDonald, and I wasn't feeling that maybe he was feeling the fact that Rory should have got round three because of the late flurry with 10-15 seconds left in the fight, but I thought that Robbie did enough of punching Rory in that round to get it, so again 29-28 because it was clear that he had to give Robbie round one. So Robbie doing a good job of neutralizing the reach of Rory McDonald being able to step in, land hooks, and then uh, he did a good job of stuffing takedowns when he could. Damn, you know what? His athleticism was on full display here. Definitely looked really explosive against a very game Rory McDonald. The 170 cuts have been good for him as of late. So I'm glad he's finding a second win in the welterweight division. And I guess he might be in the spot for a number one contenders match. Or maybe he might be the number one contender. Because this was supposed to be uh, passing of the torch from George St. Pierre to Rory McDonald. So... Robbie Lawler had other plans and spoiled that. I'm just saying this kind of might be far-fetched, but Robbie Lawler versus Johnny Hendricks for an interim welterweight championship if Johnny doesn't get the rematch with George. I think that'd be really cool. So that's what I want to see for Robbie Lawler. As for Rory McDonald, maybe him versus Carlos Condit in a rematch. Put that on a free card, make it headline. I think that would be ultra dope. Maybe in Canada, Winnipeg, BC. I think that would make a lot of sense. So that's what I would want to see out of Rory McDonald. Still a good scrap. Definitely glad that Robbie Lawler is back on the map though. Now we can move on to that Tyron Woodley-Josh Koscheck match. Also in welterweight. weight. Josh Koscheck getting knocked out again. Tyron Woodley looking crazy flashy with those fists. So what happens with Tyron Woodley, of course... In the welterweight division, there's a lot of top 10, top 15 matchups you can make. Maybe they want to pair him versus Carlos Condit. Maybe Tyron Woodley versus uh, Jake Allenberger. You can make that a thing. Who knows? We'll see. But Josh Koscheck, you know, him getting knocked out again. I believe that's his third time in the UFC now. Maybe fourth. That's Tiago. That's Woodley. That's Lawler. Maybe I'm missing one. I just can't think right now. But... He is getting knocked out, making a lot of money compared to most UFC fighters. He's fighting on these main cards, either dropping close decision or getting knocked out, like I said. Wouldn't be surprised if they cut him. Now, I'm not saying Josh Koscheck isn't UFC caliber, because he definitely is. But, you know what, maybe the UFC just doesn't feel like paying him that money. Although, it's not a lot of money when you look at the real scheme of things. It's just, it's a lot of money compared to what they pay the rest of the guys. So, wouldn't be surprised to see Kos fighting in Royal Series of Fighting, or Bellator in the next year. And last but not least, on the main card, Flyweight's Ali Bagautinov versus Tim Elliott. Now, I called Bagautinov winning this fight, and he did. You know, I thought he was more aggressive with his punches. His combination's definitely a little stronger uh, in close quarters as well. I thought Tim Elliott's flashy strike he would not be 
that effective compared to the short punches that Ali was throwing. So good for Ali to be able to throw that kind of stuff. Maybe him versus John Lineker makes sense now. Tim Elliott, he is still a top 10 flyweight because there's not a heck of a whole lot of flyweights in that division. So maybe you can make him versus Jose Maria Tome or someone like that. Who knows? And now we can run through the preliminary card. Donald Cerrone versus Evan Dunham. Now this is what Donald Cerrone is supposed to do to a guy like Evan Dunham. I did pick Dunham because I thought that Dunham was going to fight a Donald Cerrone who wouldn't be hungry, maybe gas a little bit, but Donald Cerrone definitely prepped for this fight, had a game plan, just marching forward, landing the stronger combinations, and of course when it wound up on the ground, able to put the complacent Dunham in the triangle. Very nice win for Donald Cerrone in the lightweight division. Moving on, middleweight fight between Talos Latis and Ed Herman. Anyone can take down Ed Herman, clearly. So that's why Talos Latis won 30-27. Rick Story versus Brian Ebersole. Hard to pick Brian Ebersole because he was coming off, what, like a year and a half long layoff. Got to go with the Rick, the bedtime story in this case, and he won 30-27. Eric Perez versus Edwin Figueroa. Perez better at everything, 30-27. Jason Hyde versus Anthony Lapsley, the better grappler won. Jason High, 29-28. Sergio Pettis versus Will Campisano. Sergio Pettis better at everything, 1-30-27. And John Volante versus Cody Donovan. I thought he was going to get the better of the striking because I liked his more orthodox style, and he proved it with that TKO. And I guess that about does it for the preliminary card. And in general for UFC 167, again, very good card overall. If you guys didn't catch some of these fights, or all of them, check out the whole card because it was definitely dope for me. 20th anniversary for the UFC. Hopefully the UFC has another fruitful 20 years because I am definitely a fan of this sport. I don't think it's going to be as hot 20 years from now, but who knows? We'll see. Maybe Dana White and the management can prove me wrong. But again, controversial night of fights with that main event, of course. But it is what it is. We'll see what George St. Pierre feels like doing. Anyway, that does it for me. Thank you for all the support. Once again, please subscribe if you guys haven't yet. Tell me in the comments section below your thoughts. Give me a thumbs up if you liked the video. Deuces for all my supporters. Bruises for all my haters. And take care. Peace.